Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Gene Crane and Hugh Marlowe in Margie. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. If anyone in our audience graduated from high school without experiencing a severe case of uh, puppy love, well, I'm very much surprised. And if you think back to those days right now, I imagine you'll be inclined to laugh at what was then a deadly serious romance. Well, teenage romance continues to be deadly serious. But tonight we're going to take you back to those nostalgic high school days of 1928. And the child is in triumph for a pretty little girl named Maggie. Starring in her original role is an extremely pretty girl named Jean Crane. And as her co-star, talented Hugh Marlowe. Yes, teenagers take life very seriously, and we're glad they do. Because one of the problems they're concerned about is a good complexion. And lovely mothers everywhere can recommend their own Lux Toilet Soap care to their daughters because they know Lux Soap is a perfect beauty care for lovelier complexions. Now the curtain rises on Margie, starring Jean Crane in the title role, and Hugh Marlowe as Mr. Fontaine, with Jane Darwell as Grandma. <laughs> It's a rainy Saturday afternoon, and in the attic of a pleasant little house in a pleasant little town, a young mother and her teenage daughter are rummaging through a dusty collection of trunks and boxes. The daughter has discovered an old phonograph and a carton of records. Can you imagine, Mother? The phonograph actually still works. Well, after all, dear, it's not quite an antique yet. You used to have to wind this thing every time you wanted to play a record? Oh, we put up with a lot of hardships in those days. My goodness, when you look at these. What are they? Just an old pair of bloomers I used to wear. Yeah. Gee, they're hideous. I mean, well, they're, they're so bulky. Well, they were quite a problem now and then. Mother, tell me all about the terrific things you did when you were my age. Well, I, I went to Central High School just like you were doing. But I'm not so sure a terrific event of 1928 will seem so terrific to you in 1951. Oh, Mother, now you're just being difficult. Well, all right, then. Let's look at my old photograph album. Now, here. This is a picture of Johnny Green. Oh, for corn's sake. Well, what's that thing he's wearing? Why, a raccoon coat, of course. He was the only boy in school with a raccoon coat and a such black hawk. A uh, what? It was a, a kind of automobile, dear. Oh, you went for him, huh? Oh, I went for him, all right. But it was Mary Bell who had him hogtied. Mary Bell? Uh-huh. She used to live next door to it. Well, anyway, one day after school was out. Hi, I'm Mary Bell. Johnny, you're terrible. If you keep me waiting like this again... Oh, banana oil. Get in the car. Oh, I promise we take Margie home, too. For crying out loud, do we always have to drag Margie McDuff along? Well, I can't help it. After all, she does live next door to me. Boy, what a pain in the neck. Say, did you see the new French teacher? Yeah, I saw him. Is he good looking? His name's Fontaine. Look, if Margie don't show up in two minutes, we're going to get... There she is. Hi, Margie. Oh, hello, Mary Bell. Hi, Johnny. Well, come on, McDuck. Don't just stand there. I... I can't. What do you mean, you can't? Mary Bell, come here a minute. Oh, please. What's the matter? Mary Bell, please. Oh, just a minute, Johnny. What are you so flustered about? Not, not so loud, huh? Did it, did, do you have a safety pin, Mary Bell? What do you want a safety pin for? The elastic in my bloomers. It just broke. I, I should have helped it. I, I think I've got one in my purse. Hey, what's the matter, McDuff? What are you standing so funny for? Take him away. Oh, take him away. Here's the safety pin. You want us to wait for you? No, just go on home. And if you dare tell Johnny Green what's the matter, I'll kill you. I won't. Goodbye, Margie. Well, where is she going? Margie just decided to to wait for something. Well, what's she waiting for, the fall? Oh, Johnny, you're a scream. <laughs> you don't know how funny that is. 
Here I am, Margie. Hey, Margie. Huh? Roy. Oh, gosh, I'm glad you waited for me. How come you didn't go home with Mary Bell? Oh, because I didn't, that's all. What's the matter, Margie? Anything wrong? Oh, no, Roy. It's just I'm disappointed. Hey, you shouldn't do that. What? Go around with safety pins in your mouth. I knew a kid once who swallowed a safety pin. Roy, I wish you'd go home. I've got some things to do in in the library. Okay, I'll go with you. No. What are you walking so funny for, Margie? Anything I can do? Yes, go home and don't bother me. Oh, gee whiz. Okay, okay. Oh, hello, Margie. Oh, he- hello, Miss Palmer. Uh, I have those books for you for your debate. Oh, oh, oh yes, the, the debate. Well, can I pick them up in a minute, Miss Palmer? I want to go over there in the c- c- corner. Well, what's over there in the corner? I've got to hitch up. I, I mean, I've got to catch up on my p- p- political philosophy. Of course, dear, run along. Thank you. Well, hello, Ralph. And how does our new French teacher like Central High? Oh, very much. You should see my classes, standing room only, Isabel. I've never heard of such a passion to acquire French. Ah, girls mostly, I uh, suppose. (laughs) The girls think you're just too darling for words. Oh, come on now, Isabel, cut it out. Say, this is uh, quite a nice library you've got here. Oh, well, would you like a book? Yes, yes, I would. Help yourself, Ralph. We still talk the faculty. Thank you. Oh, hello. <gasps> What's the matter? Well, it's n- n- nothing. I, I just didn't know you were, were there. Well, I didn't know you were there either till I took these books off the shelf. Then I saw you on the other side of the rack. <laughs> Do you like poetry, too? P- poetry? Yes. Isn't there poetry on your side? Uh-uh. P- political philosophy. Oh, I see. Oh, but, but I'm all finished with what I came in here for. G- goodbye, Mr. Fontaine. Wait a minute. Uh, you're you're in one of my classes, aren't you? Yes, Mr. Fontaine. Well, do you two know each other? Oh, yes, Isabel. Oh, uh, I call Miss Palmer Isabel. We've been good friends for some time. <laughs> Margie's our champion debater. Oh, we're very proud of her. Why, she's the youngest student in her class. Well, that's fine. As a matter of fact, Margie, the principal asked me to be the chairman of the next debate. That's Wednesday, isn't it? We, yes, Mr. Fontaine. Well, uh, well, if you'll excuse me now, I'm, I'm trying to find a certain volume of work. Well, why the long face, Margie? Why did you have to tell him that I'm a debater and younger than other people? Golly, when a person meets another person for practically the first time, she doesn't want to be known as a debater and, and younger than other people. Oh, but I'm sure he'll appreciate you being so smart. Don't you think he's cute? I don't know. I don't generally notice how teachers look. Well, he is cute. Uh, your books are on my desk, Margie. Good night, dear. Good night, Miss Palmer. <laughs> waited for you, Margie. I figured if I sat there long enough, you'd come out sometime. Well, you're very nice to carry my books, Roy. Oh, that's okay. Say, when you came out of the library, who was that that opened the door for you? Mr. Fontaine, the new French teacher. What did he want? Well, he merely happened to open the door for me. I don't trust Frenchmen. He isn't French. (laughs) Well, then why does he teach it? Oh, Roy, sometimes you act just like... Oh, that's Papa. Huh? Papa, Papa! That's awful. What's awful? That car that just went by, that was my father. I miss seeing him. You know, Margie, I've been to your house several times now, and I've never even met your father. Well, he he doesn't live with us. Huh? Why doesn't he? I mean, are your folks divorced or something? Of course not. My my mother died when I was a baby, and, well, ever since, I've lived with my grandmother. Well, doesn't your grandmother like your father or something? Of course she does. It's only... Well, Oh, for goodness sake, Roy, I don't see how it's any of your business. Okay, okay. Just that Papa was all broken up when my mother died, and he went away for for a long time. And then when he came back, he just started living by himself. And, oh, it's better that way, too, because, well, after all, what does a businessman know about girls? Oh. Papa's a very wonderful man, and, and we're very fond of each other. And he has a terrific business, so we can't always see each other all the time. So we try to see each other on Wednesday afternoon. Oh, of course, he pays for everything, but 
Well, I mean, Papa's a widower. Yeah, he would be. I mean, if you're a mother. Uh, yeah, of course, I see what you mean. Well, come on, Roy. I've got to get home sometime. Thanks a lot for walking home with me, Roy. I guess you'd better be going now, huh? Goodbye. Oh, I'm in no hurry. Oh. Well, would you like to come in and say hello to my grandmother? Oh, sure. Why not? Okay. Wait here on the porch a second. Pretty late, Aunt Margie. I know, Grandma, but I couldn't help it. You see, I was standing there. Yes, I know. Mary Bell stopped by and told me. Now, I've told you a dozen times to fix those rumors. Naturally, they fell down. Grandma, please. He's on the porch. Who's on the porch? You can come in, Roy. Hello, Mrs. McSweeney. Come on in, Roy. Oh, thanks, Mrs. McSweeney. You know, I've been meaning to ask you about your fireplace here in the living room. What's the matter with that fireplace? Oh, I don't mean the fireplace. I mean that old lock and chain hanging up there in the mantel. Young man, I lashed myself to the railing of the White House with that lock and chain. It took four cops and a hacksaw to pry me loose. I spent two days in jail. Gee whiz, what for? For a very noble cause. Young man, I was campaigning for the right of women to vote. They called us suffragettes. Oh, yeah, I read about that. My father says a woman's place is in the home. A woman's place is wherever she makes it. Now, I've raised Margie to take a deep interest in politics. And someday, I hope she'll be the first woman president of the United States. Oh. Grandma, please. Well, Roy, I, I know you're in a dreadful hurry to get home. It's so frightfully late. Well, goodbye, Roy. Call on us again, young man. Yeah, well, goodbye, Mrs. McSweeney. Margie. I'm sorry you have to rush off. Well, I don't have to go yet. Well, thanks again, Roy. Thanks again. Goodbye. Oh, Grandma. What's the matter with you? Don't you understand? I don't want to be the first woman president of the United States. Well, for heaven's sakes, why not? Not even if you, you paid me. And I wish you wouldn't keep telling that to people. Oh, now, now, honey, what's wrong? Well, first Miss Palmer tells people that I'm a debater and younger than other people. And then you have to go and tell Roy that you were chained to the White House and sent to jail. And then about me being the first woman president. Oh, we'll probably never come back. I bet a cookie phoned you right after dinner. Do you think so? Grandma... In your opinion, is Roy Adams' apple very noticeable? <laughs> Why, no, dear. No, oh, you're just being nice. You can't help noticing it, I guess. It hits you right in the eye. <laughs> oh, well, I guess Roy's better than nobody. Oh, well, now you wouldn't want a silly, vain, conceited boy like Johnny Green for a bowl, would you? Johnny? Oh, yes. Yes, Grandma. I certainly would. <laughs> Cynthia. Still working on that debate, Miss Margie? Oh, you should just listen to that photograph of yours. Oh, I'm working, Cynthia. Your grandma says it's time you was in bed. Why are you waving your arms around like that for? I'm rehearsing my gestures. You ain't rehearsing, honey. You shot a boxer. Cynthia, do you know anything about Frenchmen? All I know is they eat frog legs and snails. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Fontaine wouldn't eat snails. Oh, every girl in school's got a crush on him already. Including you. Well, oh, I've got more sense than to get a crush on a teacher. <laughs> that chance I'd have anyway. Cynthia, do you think a woman could learn to love a man with an Adam's apple? Well, a friend of mine, her husband's got a daughter. She's got seven kids. <laughs> Don't seem to trouble her none. Oh, come over here to the window, Miss Margie. Look down there. What? They're on Mary Bell's porch. She and that raccoon coat boy. My, my, they're the kissiest couple. Been at it most of the evening. I, I know. You've been peeking too? Of course not. I only meant, well, well, anyway, how can people waste their time like that? Why, I think it's disgusting. <laughs> well, good night, Miss Margaret. Good night, Cynthia. It's really not so noticeable. Not when Roy wears a high collar. Oh, well. Grandma, his father let Roy have the model tea today. Well, that's fine. Oh, 
Oh, golly, I almost forgot. Huh? Why, I skate. Everybody's going ice skating after the debate. Grandma, do you suppose... Do you suppose maybe Papa would come and hear me debate? I mean, it is Wednesday anyway, and all it would mean is going to the high school instead of here, and and he could hear me debate. I think it's a wonderful idea. Then ask him, Grandma. Call him up now. Oh, I'll do nothing of the sort. You stop by his office and ask him yourself. But, but I don't think Papa likes to have me stop in his office. He's always so busy. Oh, rubbish. Now you do as I say. Well, all right. And don't forget, Grandma, the high school auditorium at 3 o'clock. Gosh, you're, you're sure quiet, Margie. Golly, don't worry about your father. You, you left a message for him, didn't you? Yes, it wasn't his fault he wasn't in his office. Sure is funny, Margie. I never knew your father was an undertaker. He's a mortician. <laughs> and what's so funny about it? Well, I... I well, I'm sure it's a very interesting business. And I'll bet it's a good business, too. I mean, uh, well, gee whiz, people are always dying. <clears throat> he can't help being in the business he's in. Oh, it's all right. I, I don't mind. Honest. Yes, you do. Everybody minds. I mind. I'd give anything on earth if he was just a bricklayer or something. Well, Margie, do you, do you suppose he'll, he'll come over to the school and hear you debate? How do I know? Papa can hardly plan anything. It's just like you said. People are always dying. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard Miss Margie McDuff, captain of the Central High Debating Team. Now the next speaker, for the negative, is Mr. Arnold Harrison, Polytechnic High School. Mr. Chairman, honorable judges, worthy opponents, and ladies and gentlemen, my worthy opponents, the Central High Orators, have spoken to you of the high cost of keeping the Marines in Nicaragua. The cost. Yes, please. Boy, oh boy, Mary Bell, I've had about all of this I can stand. But where are we go, Johnny? Ice skating. But we can't. We're supposed to stay in the auditorium and listen. Well, not me. Anyway, the orchestra doesn't start at the skating rink till 4 o'clock. Well, we'll just stand here in the corridor then. If I go back in that auditorium, I'll fall asleep. <gasps> Somebody's coming. I beg your pardon. Is there a debate going on in there? And how? Thank you, young man. Thank you very much. Can you imagine somebody wanting to hear that stuff? John. Do you know who that was? Who? Margie's father, Mr. Angus McDuff. He's an undertaker. Mm. Poor Margie. A grandmother who's nuts and an undertaker for a father. <laughs> oh, you. Let me compare now the record of the Nicaraguan people during the ten years preceding the arrival of our Marines with the notable achievements since made in that troubled land. Why, as far back as 1900, ladies and gentlemen, Now, once again in rebuttal, Miss Margie McDuff. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the strongest argument that our opponents have been able to advance this afternoon is that American occupation will raise the standard of living of the Nicaraguans and enable them to buy American plumbing. Ladies and gentlemen, would you turn in liberty for a bathtub? Would you? Where is the conscience in the heart of America? If we can say, give us liberty or give us death, then we have no right to tell the people of Nicaragua that they should take bathtubs instead of freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, we fought in 76, in 1860, and in 1918 to make the world safe for democracy. And we do it again and again. Don't let us ever forget our brave past. Don't let the flag of the United States mean bathtubs and plumbing instead of liberty. I say to you, take the Marines out of Nicaragua and bring them home to defend liberty always. But never plumbing. 
Thank you. Gosh, Margie, you are wonderful. Jenny, he's here. My father's here. Where, Margie? Where? In the fourth row with my grandma and, and, and Mr. Fontaine. You know, Angus, sitting here and watching those children ice skate, I have mind to rent a pair myself. Yeah. Well, are you glad you came, Mr. Fontaine? I wouldn't have missed it for anything. And I might easily have, Mr. McSweeney, if you hadn't introduced yourself at school. <laughs> I had to introduce myself. Margie's got a crush on you. <laughs> well... Mr. McDuff, your daughter's almost as good a skater as she is a debater. You know, Margie would look awfully nice in a skating outfit like Mary Bell Tenner. Well, buy one, Grandma, buy one. Just send me the bill. You approve of a young girl exposing her bare legs, Mr. Fontaine? I certainly do. Always keep in mind, Mrs. McSweeney, that I studied in Paris, France. She's right. She's right, the child's right. Angus, what are you mumbling about? We should take the Marines out of Nicaragua. She's absolutely right. Yes, sir. I write my congressman about it. Good. Why don't we send the Marines down there in the first place? You tell me that, sir. You just tell me that. I'm sorry I'm such a terrible ice skater, Margie. Maybe when... When they play a slower tune, I'll do better. You're doing beautifully, Roy. Isn't it fun? No. Look. Look at Mary Bell and Johnny. Oh, they do skate divinely. A couple of show-offs. Gosh, Margie. That sure was a swell speech you made this afternoon. Why, thank you, Roy. And you look... Well, you look so sort of intense and full of fire. Golly, I did... Hi, Margie. Hello, Roy. Hello, Mary Bell. Isn't he nice to find? Oh, hello, Johnny. I am mixed up. Well, I won't be long, Johnny. Where's she going? She's got to get another lace for her shoe. Oh. Well, just don't stand there, Johnny. Can't you see Margie wants you to skate with her? Oh, don't be silly, Roy. Well, well he doesn't want to skate with me. Oh, I don't mind. Come on, McDuff. Why, why Johnny. <laughs> Girl's right. Rank imperialism, that's what it is. Why don't we let the Nicaraguans mind their own business? Oh, forget it, Angus. Look at your daughter. She's skating with that Johnny Green. She's waving at us. Hi, Margie. Oh, you're doing fine. Wait a minute. They've stopped skating. Something's wrong with Margie. Well, oh, she's holding her stomach. Oh, I bet it was so hot dog. She is wrong. What's the matter, Margie? Are you sick or something? No. Just go away. Johnny, please. But if you don't feel good, you better hang on to me. Hey, Mary Bell. I'm coming. I've got to sit down. Here? On the ice? I've got to. And go away. Well, gee whiz. Okay. Mary Bell. Mary Bell, stand in front of me. Oh, please. Margie, you're losing something. I know. I never did fix them. What do I do? Gosh, I don't know. Look, they're coming. Your grandma and your father and Mr. Fontaine. Mr. Fontaine. Gee, are you lucky. Hey, what happened? Is she badly hurt? It looks like something fell down. I mean, she fell down, I guess. Sit on them, Margie. Sit on them. I'm trying to. Oh. It's probably her ankle. Get on with here, everybody. Shoo, shoo. Grandma, Grandma, it is my ankle. My, my ankle hurts. I'll get a doctor. I'll just relax, Angus. I've got a muffler. I can bind her ankle. Temporarily, at least. Margie, stop squirming. What are you looking for? Come here, Grandma. Well, Grandma, my bloomers. Your what? Grandma. Well, where are they? I'm sitting on them. I, I think. But if I get up, well, for heaven's sake. Maybe while Daddy and Mr. Fontaine are fixing my ankle, I can sort of slip them into your coat. Hurry up. Get ready, Grandma. I... Grandma! They're gone! Gone? <gasps> what do you know? Oh, uh, now, Angus, I, uh, I think you and Mr. Fontaine better get a doctor after all. I'll stay right here with Margie while you go. 
John, wasn't it awful? But I can't figure out what happened to her, Mary Bell. She was skating fine, and all of a sudden she kind of lost her equilibrium. You said it, Johnny. Her best embroidered one, too. <laughs> In just a few moments, we'll return with Act Two of Margie. And now, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, with the Lux Movie News of the Week. Tonight, John, it's 20th Century Fox's lively new comedy, Love Nest. Take an ex-GI who wants to be a writer, put him and his wife into a rundown rooming house she has purchased, and Love Nest turns into a nest of riotous trouble. Put in two comedy players like William Lundigan and June Haver as the GI and his wife. And you've got a riot of laughs. Oh, the picture is just that. William Lundigan is beset by rent-dodging tenants and plumbing bills piling up when suddenly a former army buddy arrives. She's Miss Marilyn Monroe. A whack. Uh Uh-oh. Not the pun, but the situation must get very (laughs) wacky. Especially with Frank Fay also present as an elderly Casanova pursuing wealthy widows. The picture is one to see. Miss Haver is splendid in her first great comedy role. Two gorgeous blondes like June and Marilyn in one picture are certainly a treat for moviegoers. Ah, yes. They're two of Hollywood's prettiest Lux girls. Both of them with really Lux lovely complexions. Naturally. Nine out of ten screen stars depend on this gentle complexion soap for the care their skin needs. And Lux in the big bath size is a Hollywood favorite, too. It makes such a luxurious beauty bath. As June Haver says, Lux fragrance is so delicate. And it clings so long. Yes, the rich, fragrant lather makes you sure of skin that's sweet, fresh all over. Now, here's a tip right from Hollywood. Why don't you try the generous satin smooth bath cake? Even in hardest water, the lather is quick, rich, and creamy. And Lux Lather is active, gentle, but so thorough. It leaves your skin softer and smoother. Lux Lovely all over. Discover why nine out of ten screen stars... Use Lux Toilet Soap. Now, Mr. William Keeley, our producer. Act two of Margie, starring Jean Crane as Margie and you Marlowe as Mr. Fontaine. <laughs> well, let's leave 1928 for a moment and return to the attic in a pleasant little house where the young Bobby Sutter continues to press her mother for the secrets of her youth. Holy cow, Mother. You mean to say you lost your bloomers in front of all those people at the skating rink? Oh, I'm afraid I did, darling. But I was hoping desperately that no one besides Grandma and Mary Bell knew the awful truth. The others had a vague idea that I'd sprained my ankle or something. Apart from the bloomers, I had had a very happy day. Well, Margie, you certainly had a big day. Oh, a wonderful day, Grandma. You call losing your best bloomers wonderful? Darling, no. But I did get to skate with Johnny Green. And Papa came to the debate. And, and Mr. Fontaine. Oh, and Papa stayed for dinner and, and kissed me goodnight twice. I'm afraid you've got your father all worked up over Nicaragua. <laughs> <laughs> he seems very interested. I still wonder what happened to your bloomers. They couldn't have walked away. Oh, Grandma, please, let's not talk about it. I'll never be able to face anyone again. Now, who on earth... It couldn't be Roy. Oh, maybe it's just Mary Bell. Who is he, Cynthia? It's that person, Miss McQueen. It's Mr. Fontaine. Oh, no, no. Oh, Grandma, just look at me in my bathroom. Well, come on in, Mr. Fontaine. Oh, Betty saw. I mean, this afternoon, my... B- b- but, well, how nice of you to stop by. Good evening, Mrs. McSweeney. Mm. Hello, Margie. I uh, just happened to be taking a walk, and it occurred to me to drop in and see how the invalid was getting along. Well, uh, how is your ankle, Margie? Oh, it's fine. It, it hardly hurts at all. Well, I'm delighted. After all, it would certainly be a shame not to be able to go to the prom next week because of a sprained ankle. Have a chair, Mr. Fontaine. Oh, thank you. Uh, Margie, if your foot's really better, why don't you go to your room and get Mr. Fontaine's muffler? Oh, yes. It it was really very nice of you to bind my ankle with your lovely muffler, Mr. Fontaine. Oh, Margie, just a minute. Here. A package for me? 
yes. In the excitement this afternoon, I believe you... I believe you lost your handkerchief. Oh, uh-huh. I, I, I'll get you my muscle. Handkerchief, Mr. Fontaine? Well... That was very tactful. Thank you. Remember, Mrs. McSweeney, I studied in Paris, France. When, when a person receives an intimate gift from a gentleman friend, she just doesn't go around blabbing about what it is. Intimate? Margie, what do you mean? Oh, something. Margie, do you suppose Mr. Fontaine is going to invite you to the prom? The prom? Oh, I really don't know what Mr. Fontaine's motives are. Excuse me, Mary Bell, men hate to be kept waiting, you know. Prom. Oh, as if anyone else would ask me but Roy Hornsdale. But what if he does? Mr. Fontaine. Oh, gosh. Marty, I'm coming, Grandma. Take it easy. Mr. Fontaine just left. He... he left? He said you could bring his muffler to school tomorrow. Marty, did you hear me? Yes, Grandma. I heard. <laughs> Why aren't you dressed? Didn't you tell me the prom starts at 8.30? I'm not going to the prom, Grandma. That was Roy on the phone just now. Oh, he's got the sniffles again. It's his tonsils this time. His folks won't let him go. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'd just as soon stay home. Well, Mary Bell's going to the prom with Johnny. I'm sure they'd be glad to take you along. Without an escort? I'd rather die. Besides, Johnny doesn't like me tagging along even to come home from school. Look out the window. She's coming here. Who? Mary Bell. Margie, 20 years from now, you look at Johnny Green and you wonder what you ever saw in him. 20 years from now, I'll be an old woman and it won't matter. <laughs> I'm coming, Mary Bell. Oh, she'll just gloat over you. Don't you dare tell her what happened to Roy. Well, it's true, isn't it? <laughs> Quit pretend, wouldn't you? Hello, Mary Bell. Margie, I just simply had to come over. Look, Johnny sent them. Imagine, two orchids. Oh. Oh, hello, Mrs. McSweeney. Hello, you flapper. <laughs> uh, 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 orchid? Well, I suppose you'll be going with Roy, huh? No, his cold's worse. Margie. But I'm still going. You are? But who is? Oh, you'll find out. Margie McDuff, I bet you've been holding out on me right along. But it couldn't be. Not with him. Not with Mr. Fontaine. They, they say Frenchmen dance very well. Oh, gosh. Well, I really better get back. I'm going to take a bubble bath and a simply terrific perfume I have, which absolutely is guaranteed to intoxicate men by its fragrance. Goodbye, Margie. Goodbye, Mary Bell. Mr. Fontaine. Gosh. I'm going up to my room, Grandma. Yes, dear. I'll get the phone. Hello? Hello, Grandma. It's Angus. What's on your mind, Angus? Why, uh, nothing, Grandma, nothing. Uh, just wondering how everyone is. Oh, uh, incidentally, <coughs> you'll be very interested to know I just threw a salesman out of my office. You did? Why? Tried to sell me a gross of hand-dipped candles made in Nicaragua. <laughs> oh, I told him a thing or two. Don't talk to me about candles, I said, until you can bring me word that our Marines have been withdrawn, sir. Well, were the candles any good? Well, what do I care? Nothing is good, madam, if it betrays the heart and conscience of America. Angus, have you anything special to do tonight? We Americans fought in 76 in... What do you mean? Have I anything to do? Well, have you? Well... Mr. Van Buren of the Forest Acre 
Baker's mortician service was coming over to discuss a merger of our interests. Well, how about merging your interests with Margie's? Huh? Angus, she's had her heart set on going to the high school prom tonight. Only this boy she was going with can't make it. Well, that's a little out of my line, Grandma. Haven't been, been to a dance in 20 years. Oh, well, who cares? Now, don't be late at 8 o'clock, and don't you dare show up without a corsage. Well, Margie, uh, Margie likes gardenias, doesn't she? Oh, gardenias, my foot. Orchids. Three orchids. <laughs> Grandma, 8 o'clock with three orchids. Thanks, Angus. Goodbye. Margie, Margie, come down here. I've got news for you. I simply don't understand, Grandma. Who is coming to take me to the prom? Now stop asking questions and get into your formal. Grandma, if you call someone and made him take me, I'll never forgive you. He called me. This is my role of yours. It's not Joe Kelly, Grandma. He's only 15 and his hands are always clammy. <laughs> He's much older than 15 and his hands are not clammy. <laughs> Grandma, do you remember that bubble bath I gave you for Christmas? Of course. Would you let me use a little? Mary Bell's taking a bubble bath and she says it simply intoxicates men with its exotic fragrance and, and, and so I thought... Oh, help yourself, honey. But hurry up. <laughs> Margie, I'll never get you hooked up. I'm sorry, Cynthia. Grandma, do you think I look sophisticated? Well, yes, for your age. <laughs> the, the doorbell. Yeah, I'll go down. Grandma, who is it? You've simply got to tell me. Oh, you'll find out. He's on time, anyway. Don't worry, honey. As soon as she's downstairs, I'll go down to and take a peek. I'll tell you who it is. Well, this is quite a surprise. Mr. Fontaine. Well, I hope you'll excuse me, but I was driving by, oh, so you I... Oh, so nice in your tuxedo, Mr. Fontaine. Oh, thank you. And that corsage is lovely. Huh? Well, I'm about to call for Miss Palmer. Uh, you know the school librarian? I'm taking her to the prom tonight. I just thought I'd leave this for Margie. It's her French theme. She was anxious to know what grade I'd given her. What grade did you give her? Oh, yeah, of course. Margie's an exceptionally bright child, Mrs. McSweeney. An enchanting child, I might add. Child, indeed. Oh, I doubt if you're eight years older. Well, frankly, I did lie a little bit about my age to get on the faculty here. Well, uh, I suppose Margie's going to the prom. Uh, who's taking her? Her father. Well, just between us. I wish I were. You know, it's a very strange thing. I... I Margie, that Frenchman. My, my, is he dressed up. And with flowers, too. But it can't be. Mr. Fontaine. Cynthia, do you suppose Grandma bribed him to take me on a car? I didn't have anyone else. Oh, she don't need no bribe, honey. He's a young man, ain't he? And you're a pretty girl, ain't you? Child, I've been telling you that all along. Do you really think he likes me? Oh, I've had a crush on him ever since the day he came to Central High. My diary's simply full of him, Cynthia. <laughs> well, it looks like a two-way crush to me, honey. Now, go on, get on down there. Go on, get Margie. Well, good evening. And how pretty you look. <laughs> Thank you. You look very pretty, too. I, I mean, you oh, look... Excuse me, the telephone. Oh, what a beautiful corsage. Why, how perfectly lovely of you to bring me flowers. Margie, I... I don't think that... Oh, they're just beautiful. Uh, Margie, uh, uh, this French theme of yours, you'll be glad to know that... Yes, well, uh, as a matter of fact, you, I... Margie. It's Helen Bailey. Oh, excuse me a second, Mr. Fontaine. Oh, I know I'm going to wake up and find out this is all just a dream. Margie, you you, you don't understand. I... Oh, Helen. Mrs. McSweeney. You don't have to tell me. I know. She thinks you're taking her. What am I going to do? Well, it's all my fault. You've simply got to think of something. Oh, that's simply gorgeous. Look, Helen, I have to fly now. Mr. Fontaine's waiting for me. Uh-huh. Okay, I'll see you at the prom. Goodbye. Helen thought I couldn't go to the prom, Grandma, on account of Roy's tonsils. Oh, when I told her you were taking me, Mr. Fontaine, why, she was just, just speechless. Oh, this card. This card on my corsage. Margie. I'm going to put it in my scrapbook and keep it forever. You don't I'll understand. Even... What? The card. It says, 
Miss Palmer. I'm sorry, Margie. That's what I was trying to explain. I stopped by merely to leave your French theme. It... It's excellent. Thank you. Margie. Let her go. Oh, this is terrible. I'll call Miss Palmer up and explain. She'll understand. No, you just run along, Mr. Fontaine. Margie wouldn't go with you now in a million years. We'll return with Act Three of Margie. Now let me introduce my guest for tonight, Miss Eileen Christie. She's petite, she's blonde, and she has a glorious singing voice. Well, thank you, Mr. Keeley. I've studied singing and drama since I was a child in San Francisco. You've appeared in Civic Opera there, and you won, I understand, first place in the National Atwater Kent Auditions. But I've never once sung in pictures. Hmm. My screen roles have all been dramatic. You know, as a student of drama, I'm tremendously impressed with James Mason's performance in The Desert Fox. That's the documentary film 20th Century Fox has just released. The story of German Field Marshal Rommel, the man who defied Hitler. Yes, indeed, I saw the picture. And I was fascinated watching the wily Desert Fox from the time of his North African defeat up to his murder for the plot to assassinate Hitler. Cedric Hardwick also is excellent as another of the conspirators. Yes, and Jessica Tandy is Rommel's wife. The only woman in the cast comes in for plenty of attention. Well, Miss Tandy always commands attention. You know, she's such a natural beauty with a complexion where well, it certainly looks lovely. Yes, she's a real Lux girl. And her enthusiasm for Lux is one I certainly share. You're very wise, Eileen. Girls with Lux lovely complexions seem to get ahead in Hollywood. Any girl, anywhere, Mr. Kennedy, should learn what Lux soap facials can do for skin. And they're so easy. You simply cream the rich lather well in, then rinse with warm water and splash with cold. Pat with a soft towel to dry, and you'll love the way your skin feels. So soft and so smooth. Thank you, Eileen Christie. Ladies, Lux Active Lather is thorough but gentle. Naturally, this daily care really makes skin lovelier. Try using Hollywood's own beauty soap tomorrow. You'll discover you can be Lux lovely. You'll know why nine out of ten screen stars... Use fragrant white Lux toilet soap. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. The curtain rises on Act Three of Margie, starring Jean Crane as Margie and Hugh Marlowe as Mr. Fontaine, with Jane Darwell as Grandma. <laughs> Once again, we swing briefly back to the present time, where, upstairs in the attic, mother and daughter comb through events of 20 years ago. From the album of photographs, Joyce has just taken a picture. Her mother smiles reflectively as she looks at it. <laughs> yes, Joyce. This is a picture of the 1928 high school prom. Oh, and you're not even there. 
Gee, what an awful break, not being able to go to the prom. Oh, but I did go. And there's my picture. See? That's you? Golly. But, but who bought you? Well, about ten minutes after Mr. Fontaine had left the house, two other gentlemen arrived on our front porch. One of them was Roy Hornsdale. Why, it's you, Mr. McDuff. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, young man. Good evening. Gosh, is that your car? That log black limousine? <laughs> it's one of my cars, yes. Gosh. How come you're calling on Margie on Saturday? A man does not call on his daughter. And I'd like to know what business it is of yours, what day of the week I come here. Well, Margie says you always call Wednesdays. You bringing her flowers? <laughs> yes. Hey, you're not bringing her flowers left over from the... <laughs> Young man, they have an expression in Nicaragua that very aptly describes a person of your ill manners. He... Co- what am I wasting my time talking to you for? Who are you, anyway? I'm Roy Hornsdale. <laughs> Gee whiz, Mr. McDuff, don't you remember me? I was at the skating rink the afternoon that Margie hurt her ankle. Oh. Hasn't she told you about me? No. And either you ring that doorbell or let me. Oh, she's a wonderful girl, Mr. McDuff. I'm well aware of that fact. I was supposed to take her to the prom tonight, but... I got a cold. <laughs> then go to bed. Well, my folks said I could come over as long as we didn't go out, and I kept warm. Doesn't anyone believe in coming in? What is this, a convention? Hello, Grandma. What are you doing here, Roy? Good evening, Mrs. McSweeney. I figured since Margie's not going to the prom that I'd come over here and... Sorry. Well, what makes you think she's not going to the prom? Huh? Cynthia, take Roy into the kitchen and get him some hot milk or something. Milk? Milk! Get in here, Miss Hardy. Margie? Margie hit here, honey. Listen, Angus, I should explain, but I haven't got time. Margie's been crying. Now, don't ask why. Just be very tactful. <laughs> tactful, yeah. Did that sniveling boy in there make her cry? Oh, no, no. Roy's quite innocent. H- Hello, Papa. Margie. Well, come on down. Well, my dear, you you look beautiful. Simply beautiful. Why, thank you. Papa, you're you're all dressed up. <clears throat> well, you wouldn't want him to go to the prom in the business suit, would you? He's taking you. That's the big surprise. Honestly, Papa, you're taking me. Are you sure you want to? Honey, I've waited over sixteen years for the privilege. Here. Orchids. Oh, Papa, three orchids. I hope you won't be disappointed, Margie. I, I'm not a very good dancer. Oh, Papa, I'd rather be going to the dance with you than anyone else in the whole world. <laughs> Excuse me while I get my coat. Well, Angus, what are you thinking? Uh, I was thinking, Grandma, that my daughter is just as pretty and every bit as sweet as yours ever was. Uh-huh. I'm ready, Papa. Good night, Grandma. Good night, dear. She whiz, is Margie going out? She's gone out. Oh, hey, whiz. I came here to read poetry to her. <laughs> Who am I going to read poetry to now? Cynthia? Not to me, he ain't, Mr. Horns, dear. And finish your milk. <laughs> It's Margie and her father. How you changed, Mr. Fontaine. Eh? I beg your pardon? Come on, Carla. Did you see him, Johnny? Her father. But I want to explain what happened. Oh, it doesn't matter, honey. Whatever happened was a wonderful break for me. And now, uh, let's see if we can find a table, eh? Margie came with her old man. Why, so she wanted to be sure of dancing with someone, Johnny. Hey, uh, come to think of it, it's the first time I've ever seen Margie. Huh? And just what does that mean? I, uh, I don't know. Hey, me. Is this table all right, Papa? Are you sure? Oh, this is fine, dear, fine. Good evening, 
Margie. Oh, hello, Miss Palmer. Good evening, Margie. Good evening, Mr. McDuff. Nice party, isn't it? Oh, oh, yes, indeed, yes. Who is that with Mr. Fontaine? Miss Palmer, our, our librarian. Oh, yes. very attractive. She's well-preserved for her age. Margie? That's the waltz, the plane. Yes, Papa. Shall we try it? Oh, I'd love to. I, uh, beg your pardon, but may I cut in, sir? Oh, uh, well, uh, well, uh, yes, by all means, young man. By all means. Johnny. Well, you sure had them all fooled, Margie. They thought you were coming with Mr. Fontaine. Why, why, how absurd. Yeah, that's what I told them. I said, why would she want to come with some drip from the faculty? Hey, I cut in. <laughs> Pete's sake, where'd you come from? May I? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, see you later, Margie. Thanks, Johnny. Not even one little smile, Margie. I, I don't feel like smiling. Why? I made such a fool of myself. You're just trying to be nice. You don't have to dance with me. Between you and me, Margie, I'd rather dance with you than anyone else in this room. If you only knew how I feel, if you... What did you say? I said I'd rather dance with you than anyone else in this room. And I mean it. Anyone? Anyone. Oh, Mary Bell, Margie's doing all right. Oh, it's just a wall. Who wants to wall? Besides, he's just taking pity on her like Johnny did. I sure wish Mr. Fontaine would take pity on me. I... Well, what do you know? Johnny's taking pity on her again. May I cut in, sir? Well, uh, I did it to you, Johnny. I... I guess you can do it to me. I I didn't think I'd see you again so soon, Johnny. Gee, where's Margie? Where you been all my life? Right under your nose, I guess. Yeah, you're sure a smooth dancer. How, uh, how about doing this more often? No, I, I think that would be just one, one. Oh, no. <laughs> Margie, what's the matter? What's wrong? Oh, no, no. Not tonight. Margie, you look so so funny. You're not gonna faint, are you? That's a that's a very good idea. Margie! <laughs> well, Joyce, that was the last time I ever wore those bloomers. I was about to throw them away a few years ago, but your father insisted that I keep them. Oh, Mother, to think that it happened again at the prom. Oh, how perfectly ghastly it must have been for you. Oh, it was, darling. Ghastly. But what happened? Who finally got to take you home? Grandpa or, or who? Why, your father, of course. Hey, where is everybody? We're up here, Daddy, in the attic. Hello, funny face. Hello, Daddy. Well... What have you two been doing up here? Oh, we've had more fun, Daddy. Mother's been telling me all about the bow she had when she went to Central High School. Oh, she has, has she? Look at this snapshot of Johnny Green. Oh, he sounds simply terrific. Do you remember him? Yes, dear, he was a drip. <laughs> a drip of the first water. Ralph, dear, that doesn't sound so well coming from the principal of Central High School. You heard me, I said drip. But where is he now? What does he do? He's a plumber. <laughs> Lives over in Dalehurst, I think. Works for a fellow named Roy Hornsdale. You don't say. Oh, look, Daddy, all these old phonograph records. Listen to this one. How about it, Pop? Can you jive? Well, I can't exactly say I'm good at it, but... I sure like to try. Well, here we go. Hey, take it easy. <laughs> Where's Papa, darling? Didn't he come home with you? No, he was detained. The ambassador will be home for dinner, though. Ambassador? You mean he finally got it? Take a look at that evening paper. I put it right there on the trunk. Angus McDuff appointed ambassador to Nicaragua. <laughs> 
I'll be darned. In just a moment, we want you to meet our stars in person, and Mr. Keeley will tell you about next week's show. But first, here's what glamorous, fascinating Ruth Hussey says about complexion care. I've been a Lux girl for years, she says, because I've found there's nothing quite like Lux Active Lather Facials. They really do wonders for the skin. Why don't you take Ruth Hussey's tip? Lux has active lather that cleanses gently but thoroughly. You'll find daily facials with fragrant white Lux toilet soap are simple but so effective. They leave skin softer, smoother, give it quick new beauty. That's why nine out of ten screen stars use Lux toilet soap. They know it's a beauty care that works. So get Hollywood's favorite beauty soap tomorrow. Discover for yourself it's easy to be Lux lovely. Now here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. And here they are coming forward to the footlights for a well-deserved curtain call. Gene Crane and you, Marlowe. That was certainly a charming story. And you know, Gene, it's hard to believe that you're not still a high school girl. Yes, Gene, with three small boys to manage. How do you stay so young? Well, you know, I think Lux Toilet Soap helps Gene to look like a teenager. <laughs> Just look at that beautiful complexion. Thank you, Bill. I certainly am devoted to Lux Toilet Soap facials. I never miss them. Then you'll be able to go on playing high school girls for years to come. Oh, but I don't want to. I'd like to play somebody very wicked for a change. Who did you have in mind? Cruy Lou? <laughs> no, but I envy Jean Peters, who just made a picture at 20th Century Fox called Anne of the Indies. In which Anne plays a lady pirate. She's a pirate, but she's no lady. Isn't she supposed to be the adopted daughter of the famous Blackbeard? Yes, and he teaches her to be a cutthroat pirate, too. Jean has...